Good morning, everyone, and welcome, and thank you especially for coming to our second lecture of uh, our series, Remarkable Revisions. Almost a year ago, my predecessor, Dr. Kathy Christensen, had the pleasure to introduce Amy Galpin, then the museum's project curator of, uh, for American art, to our audience. Today, I have the great honor to introduce Dr. Amy Galpin. <laughs> Dr. Amy Galpin is now associate, uh, associate Curator, Art of the Americas at the San Diego Museum of Art. She received her PhD from the University uh, of Illinois, Chicago, and her dissertation is entitled A Spiritual Ma Manifestation of Mexican Muralism, Works by Jean Charlot and Alfredo Ramo Ramos Martinez. She has curated exhibitions for Women Made Gallery, the Köhnlein Museum of Art, the State Street Gallery at Robert Morris College, and the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago. She has published on the influence of Mexican muralism on both sides of the border and on the American artist Morris Topchevsky. She is a former Terra Fellow and recipient of a, great, uh, of a grant from Jean Chalot Foundation. Her latest curated show is, as uh, Ruth uh, pointed out, Marianella de la Ho's Heaven on Earth, no, Heaven and Earth, The Determined Freedom of an Undetermined Life, which is currently on view in Gallery 19. And her very latest curatorial project, Behold America, Art of the United States from three San Diego museums, will open on November 10th at the San Diego Museum of Art and the Timken Museum of Art, joining the third museum involved with this show, the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego, La Jolla. In her lecture today, Amy is using Maya Angelou's poem, Still I Rise, as a starting point to look at modern and contemporary portraiture by American artists highlighting works creating, created in the last two decades. Please join me in welcome, welcoming our Dr. Amy Galpin for what promises to be an inspiring and thought-provoking talk. Good morning. Thank you so much to the docents for inviting me to speak here today and for organizing a terrific lecture series at the museum. The docents, as some of you know and as some of you may not know, give a tremendous gift to this institution. They volunteer, they volunteer their time to learn about each aspect of the collection and share it with the public generously and with expertise. I know following this lecture you are in store for a great treat with tours by Kathy Christensen and Marcia Tankovich. I would like to thank my colleagues, Alexander Jarman, Brittany Salyers, Colin Dunn, and of course, Ruth Browdy, for their help in organizing this lecture and the entire lecture series. My talk today is meant to stir interest, or at least I hope stir interest, in an upcoming collaboration between the Museum of Contemporary Art, the San Diego Museum of Art, and the Timken Museum of Art. Behold America, Art of the United States, from three San Diego museums. We will look at works included in the show and put them in context with other works by the same artists. All the way back in 2005, the directors of each of these institutions got together, I believe it was actually at Petco Park at a baseball game, and discussed ways in which the institutions could collaborate. It seemed like a natural fit to bring together the art of the United States from each museum. Each museum has a strong collection of American art, but none of the museums can claim a comprehensive collection of art of the United States. The resulting collaboration will open here at the San Diego Museum of Art and at the Timken on November 10th. Already, a version of the show is open in La Jolla at MCASD. The project is divided into three broad, interrelated, and complex themes of forms, figures, and frontiers. While the Timken Museum is the anchor for forms, each institution will have a representation of this theme. Frontiers is presented at the Museum of Contemporary Art, and figures will be on view here at the San Diego Museum of Art. So what are figures? Well, they're mostly portraits, but they can also be so much more. On November 10th, when the exhibition opens, visitors will be able to experience figures from all three collections through the intertwined sections of Making History, Many Americans, Contemplation, 
historical icons, human anatomy, the figure as object, you might ask why the San Diego Museum of Art will present figures as opposed to focusing on forms and frontiers. The opportunity to explore the history of American portraiture in concert with other great portraits in the museum's collection was an exciting prospect. Here you see three great examples of portraits in our permanent collection. We have a tremendous collection here of portraits. We're known for our portraits. And again, the opportunity to make, while we focus on the art of the United States this fall here at the San Diego Museum of Art in our temporary exhibitions, it's also a great time to look at how these exhibitions relate to our permanent collection galleries. Here I present to you one of the most recognizable works from this upcoming exhibition of Behold America. About a year and a half ago, I gave a lecture in this room on American art and the connections between Walt Whitman's poems in his seminal work, Leaves of Grass, first published in 1855. As I prepared for today's lecture, I revisited some of the ideas and the words that I had previously shared with you. If I could, I would like to return to the last line of that lecture over a year and a half ago when I said, while certain works may not seem as avant-garde or as historically significant to the world as the visual art traditions born in other countries, American art reveals the ingenuity of a frontier country, forever and at once, proud, conflicted, and defiant. In the case of a happy coincidence, the words proud and defiant reverberate in my lecture today as I reference the poem Still I Rise by the great American poet Maya Angelou. The words proud and defiant come to bear once again as we think about American art and specifically modern and contemporary portraiture. Still I Rise first appeared in one of Angelou's collections of poems originally published in 1978 and similarly titled And Still I Rise. To set the stage for today's lecture, I will share with you the words of this poem, Still I Rise. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still I'll rise. Do you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Because I'll laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness. But still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise? that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs. Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear. I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. The definition of a portrait is that of an impression or a likeness. From the very beginning, our country, the United States, has used portraiture as a way in which to assert its identity, its political authority, its wealth, and its individual greatness. 
In fact, the creation of portraits in the colonial context and in the earliest years of the United States of America was completely connected to the desire to establish national identity. After all, a portrait of an individual is rarely just simply a portrait. It is a complexly woven statement of personal and communal identity that can serve as a record of a moment in time among a given cultural group. Portraits are often created as a way in which to remember someone, to preserve an individual's likeness, or to record or document an important occasion in the life of the subject. While some portraits are factual accounts, others are heavily constructed. And following this way of thought, some are perhaps fictions. Whether fact or fiction, though, portraits are tied to issues of power. The power of the sitter in some cases, the power of the artist in others. For Maya Angelou, in her poem, Still I Rise, the power of oppression and the power of resistance are heard loudly. One of the finest early colonial portraits in this exhibition, and perhaps one of the finest American paintings in all of San Diego, is John Singleton Copley's portrait of Mrs. Thomas Gage, a work that serves as an example of the artist's technical proficiency, declares the beauty and power of this young woman, and also functions as a metaphor for the tensions and bicultural existence between England and the United States during the colonial period. This painting in the collection of the Timken Museum of Art will be on view here at the San Diego Museum of Art as a part of the figures section of Behold America. Copley, one of the most heralded portrait painters of his age, came to New York City on June 13, 1771 to fulfill a number of portrait commissions. Margaret Kemble Gage was a well-known socialite who met the artist in his studio four days after his arrival to have her portrait painted. In 1768, Copley had painted a portrait of her husband, Thomas Gage, which is now in the, in the collection of the Yale Center for British Art. The couple had married on December 8th of 1758. Copley, like other portrait painters, often had props at his disposals for his sitters to use. In this portrait, the subject wears a Turkish costume. The style of dress was popular among fashionable American women and also English women of the time. Although the costume uh, was more popular in portraits than actually in the fashion trend, one wouldn't, a woman of, of Mrs. Thomas uh, Gage's stature would not walk the streets um, in, in such a dress. And in fact, there is reason to think that Mrs. Gage actually owned this dress, and perhaps it wasn't a prop of Copley's. Carrie Rebora Barrett, Associate Director for Collections and Administration at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, has written on this picture. Quote, it, indeed, it may have taken a Turkish woman to help Copley's use of dress here um, and to find Turkish dress at its finest, most convincingly an authentic expression. Peter Kemble, Margaret's father, was born in Smyrna of a Greek mother and lived there until he was 16. His daughter never visited Turkey, but it has been suggested that she owned the costume. This stunning portrait demonstrates the artist's attention to detail, the brass tacks on the sofa, the navy and gold sash, the folds of the dress that reveal the absence of a corset and the open and relaxed nature of which the garment is worn all contribute to the allure of the subject. But beyond the details and the pictorial qualities, there are political elements to this work, both for Copley and for the subject. The artist's parents, Mary Singleton and Richard Copley, emigrated to the United States from England. He was born in America the same year as his counter- contemporary painter, Benjamin West. And despite their beginnings in the colonies, both men would ultimately pursue their careers in England. He was an important colonial painter, and by 1774, he had garnered quite a bit of attention for his work. Copley was inspired by British portrait artists like Joshua Reynolds, and often took poses that well-known British painters like Reynolds would use um, and replicated them in his portraits. 
Mrs. Thomas Gage's husband was the commander in chief of the British Army in North America. He led the British forces in their defeat at the Battle of Bunker Hill in 1775. This defeat was a major accomplishment for the colonists fighting for independence, and this victory gave them the confidence and the energy to complete their fight. Copley refused to take sides in the Revolutionary War. Though his in-laws were Tories, he did not want to publicly align with the Whigs or Tories. One reason to not take sides was certainly his profession. Uh, his patrons included Samuel Adams, associated with the Whigs, uh, and Thomas Gage, associated with the Tories. After receiving some death threats against his family um, from Whigs, Copley left England uh, and, and later made arrangements for his loved ones in 1774. By 1775, his family joined him and they settled in a house in Leicester Square. In 1795, 20 years later, after two decades in England, Copley decided to sell the family's Beacon Hill home, definitively recognizing that they would not return to America. As I mentioned, Mrs. Thomas Gage, our subject's husband, was the commander-in-chief of the British Army. You know, many have said that maybe Mrs. Gage herself had conflicted ideas um, about what was happening in the Americas and that her family was tied to America, that she was married to such a prominent British man. A number of years ago, many of you may remember, there was quite a bit of press in the San Diego papers about Mrs. Thomas Gage being an informant uh, to, to Paul Revere. The portrait itself, however, represents a mechanism in which both Mrs. Thomas Gage and John Singleton Copley could introduce themselves to London society at a time when their, their experience in the colonies was reaching a close and at a time when they were both distant from London society. American art historian Paul Stady has surmised that although this style of dress or the act of masquerading would not have been accepted on the streets of America or entertaining in her home, he, and he ascertains that this image was the tool that Gage used to connect with the social group from which she was distanced. It made the portrait a material artifact that could generate a social discourse that otherwise did not exist for her. Other early American portraits in the figures section of Behold America include two works by the British-born painter Thomas Sully, who spent the majority of his life in the United States. Born in Horncastle, Lincolnshire, Sully was a prolific painter considered to be the most important portraitist of his time in Philadelphia. Over his 70-year career, he painted some 2,000 paintings. Though he and his family arrived in America in 1792, when Sully was just nine years old, the influence of the mother country was strong, and he was particularly inspired by the romantic British portrait style. Furthermore, he returned to England in June of 1809 and met with Benjamin West. He made copies of West's collection and met with the painter Sir Thomas Lawrence. He became a major influence, and after a year, he returned to the United States. While he received some important commissions, his large historical canvas for the state of North Carolina was rejected upon completion. The title uh, was Washington's Passage to Delaware. Following the deaths of American painters Gilbert Stuart and Charles Wilson Peale, his reputation grew immensely. His portraits included renderings of well-known actors and others involved in the rapidly growing theater community in Philadelphia. The Warrens pictured here were an important part of that artistic community. Esther Fortune was William Warren's third wife. They had six children together, and Hester, depicted here, was their eldest child. According to family historians, she lived from 1810 until 1841. She became an actress and married a musician. All of the children in the family entered the family business of theater. Esther wears a velvet robe with lace at the top of her back. In this three-quarter portrait, William Warren wears a striking black coat and a sharp, high white collar. William Warren led a theater company named the Chestnut Street Theater. In a letter dated March 29, 1976, Emily Hart wrote this letter, wrote in a letter to the museum. William Warren was the eldest brother of Henry Warren, an artist 
and my great-grandfather, two of the eight sons of Philip Warren, a cabinet maker in Bath. Henry was sent for by his brother to come to Philadelphia to paint the scenery and design the costumes for the Chestnut Street Theater, which William Warren owned with his partner, Mr. Wood. A comparison between these two paintings of, of this couple shows the different styles of the artist. The gentleman is more subdued, where the woman is presented with richer colors and a more dramatic background. Sully himself, the artist, was from a family of actors, and we can only imagine that he must have felt a special relationship to uh, the Warrens. But you can see the influence of England and the British painters in these works. You know, it's after he goes to England and is exposed to the great portraits of someone like Benjamin West, who painted in a more romantic style, that he paints the portrait of the wife whereas the portrait of the husband is much more typical of the type of colonial work uh, created uh, in the United States. Well, you've come here for a lecture to focus on modern and contemporary art, so it's time that we push forward and move on. As we move into a modern era of portraiture in the United States, power of the artist and power of the subject remain pertinent, as does the subject's individuality, and their social and economic status. Status and individuality became less tied to national identity in the 20th century and more tied to questions of either personal identity or identity as a concept linked to one's gender or to one's cultural background. In this portrait by Alice Neal, both the subject and the artist herself are tied to ideas of power and gender. Noted for her sensitive portraits of women, Alice Neal worked in relative obscurity and during the 1940s and 50s. Her work did not garner major attention until the rise of feminism in the 1960s, when both scholars and activists looked back on how women had played important but under-recognized roles in the development of art. In contrast to later portraits, this work is more finely painted and the subject more naturalistic. The subject of this painting was a friend of the artist in New York. During the 1930s, when Neil painted this portrait, she lived in Harlem. She made little money on these portraits and produced income for her family through her work on WPA-supported projects during the Depression. Her neighbors and friends in Harlem often served as models. This particular painting, though, was not a portrait of a neighbor. When the subject's husband gave this painting to the museum, and another painting by the artist of a sad clown, the couple had left New York and reloco relocated to La Jolla. Mildred and Stanley Olden were friends of Alice Neal. Neal presents Mildred as a fashion-forward woman with an eye-catching hat. Her sharp pinstripe suit, the curl in her hair, painted nails, and ring further inform her stylish nature. Born in 1912, Mildred was Stanley's second wife, and she was 19 years his junior. Her maiden name was Myers, and she was born in New York, although her family had come from Pennsylvania. The couple lived and worked in Midtown at 865 First Avenue and later at 160 East 48th Street. Stanley owned a mercantile agency, and he earned a healthy enough income that the couple traveled frequently to Europe on luxury liners like the Mauritania and the Queen Mary. According to the San Diego Museum of Arts membership records, Stanley and Mildred were members of this museum for just one year, in 1966. Mildred died in 1989 and Stanley in 1991. The portrait was given along with the other Neil painting of the sad clown later that year. Alice Neal continued to create portraits throughout her career and made a series of, por of portraits by well-known artists like Andy Warhol and Faith Ringgold, Faith Ringgold, who are both, by the way, represented in Behold America. She also turned to her sons for subjects, painting several portraits of her sons Hartley and Richard. Ginny, depicted here, was married to Hartley and the couple, Ginny alone, and Ginny with her children, were subjects for the artist on several occasions. This portrait of Ginny reveals the style of painting that Neil developed over time and the type of freedom with paint that she became known for. The portrait of Ginny uh, is less finely painted, 
the brush strokes revealing more a sense of movement in the way in which they are form, model, and represent the young girl. There are, these are looser strokes than the ones used to relate the likeness of Mildred. Neil was drawn to the directness of Ginny, and indeed in her portrait she portrays her facing the viewer and her big eyes exchange our glances at her. One of the things that is true of much of the artist's later work and is exemplified by her portrait of Ginny in the permanent collection of the Art Institute of Chicago is a sense of timelessness. While, Mil while Mildred seems a product of a bygone era, I could go see the portrait of Ginny at the Art Institute and then pass her as I exit the museum and walk down Michigan Avenue. The painter Alice Neal avoided the trends of the New York art scene when it was focused on abstract expressionism in the 1950s, followed by minimalism and then later pop art. Neal was ardently de dedicated to depicting figurative art and focusing on portraiture. Here we see a portrait of Neal among her paintings from the 40s and a picture of her apartment that the family has preserved to appear very much like the apartment that she lived in uh, when she died. Like Alice Neal, the photographer Arnold Newman was less concerned with avant-garde concepts and more dedicated to creating portraits. Newman was one of the great American portrait photographers of the 20th century. The San Diego Museum of Art has a number of Newman's portraits in, in its collection of American artists such as Frank Stella, you see Milton Avery here. In addition to his well-known portraits of artists like Picasso and Mondrian, also represented here, Newman also photographed actors and politicians. His work often appeared in popular publications like, like Life magazine. Newman was an artist that was less concerned about keeping the editions of his photographs small um, and preserving this kind of fine art legacy. He was more about getting his work out there and with the people. Born in New York, Newman spent time in Florida and in Atlantic City. He came of age during the economic depression of the 30s. He was able to attend university for a couple of years in Florida, um, but after losing his two-year scholarship um, because of funding reasons, he had to drop out of school. At this time in his life, Newman was interested in painting, but a chance encounter with an old family friend in Atlantic City while walking along the, board, the boardwalk led to a new direction in his life. This family friend had a photography studio and he asked this budding artist, would he come and move to Philadelphia and help him? Newman accepted and moved to Philadelphia where he took countless portraits. For $16 a week, he took anywhere between 60 and 100 portraits a day. This exhausting pace would serve as a great training ground for Newman, who would later become, as I've said, one of the most important American portrait artists. In his spare time, Newman experimented with abstract photography. He went to New York and had a meeting at MoMA. He asked the curator of photography, should I quit this, should I continue, am I going down the wrong path? In response, the curator called Alfred Stieglitz. Buoyed by the encouragement, Newman continued to pursue photography, and his first exhibition took place in New York in 1941 at the A&D Gallery. Coincidentally, the show was included two kind of distinct solo exhibitions, one of Arnold Newman's work and the other of Ben Rose, a noted American photographer who happened to be a childhood friend of Newman's. In New York, Newman began to take photographs of his artist friends. One of his first artist portraits was of the American painter Raphael Sawyer. One artist after the other would introduce Newman to another artist friend. Before long, Newman was on his way to taking iconic portraits of some of the most important artists of the 20th century, like Miro, George O'Keeffe, and some of the others that I've already mentioned. Many of his portraits of artists became the image, the photograph associated with that artist. Mondrian became a close friend of Newman's. The, phot the photographer spent hours in the studio of Mondrian watching him paint. He later recalled that he learned about geometric pattern and structure um, from watching the painter's attention to line, form, and color, and how it influenced his creation of photographs. Newman became associated with environmental portraiture. 
a practice in which the subject of a portrait is further revealed through their presentation and surroundings closely linked to the subject. This portrait embodies the artist's dedication to environmental photography in its portrayal of Georgia O'Keeffe on the property she owned in New Mexico that inspired so many of her canvases. Newman, was not only, Newman not only positions the artist in connection to her great muse, the desert landscape, but also emphasizes her physical connection to the land, literally in the placement of O'Keeffe's hand, but symbolically in which her skin, not perfect but beautiful, exhibits the passage of time as the sun that beats down day after day on the landscape and the land that shows the desert terrain bears the appearance of the ravages of centuries of existence. In O'Keeffe's work and in Newman, in O'Keeffe's work and in Newman's photographs, time passes. Newman created some 8,000 pictures during his career. He delighted in constructing his pictures. And about this particular work, he later remembered that he waited for days for the lighting to be just right. Although this photograph is a tremendous example of a figure, and it is included in Behold America, this work is on view at the Museum of Contemporary Art in La Jolla as a part of the Frontiers section of Behold America. To reiterate the significance of New Mexico in many American artists' lives, but also to stress how interrelated the concepts of forms, figures, and frontiers can be. A more contemporary take on the field of environmental portraiture occurs in Taryn Simon's contemporary project entitled The Innocents. In this work in the collection of the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego, which will be on view here at the San Diego Museum of Art as a part of figures, we see Simon present the wrongfully accused, uh, as she does in this series entitled The Innocent. And the wrongfully accused are either located at the site of their arrest, the site of their alibi, or the site of the crime in which they are accused of committing. Frederick Day is an ex-Marine from Iowa who was riding in a car with an open container of beer when the car was pulled over by the San Diego police. This infraction led to his arrest for rape, kidnapping, and theft. Although the rape victim and a witness chose Day out of a lineup, 13 other witnesses came forward to attest that Day was drinking at a bar at the American Legion Post 310 at the time of his crimes. Nevertheless, Day was convicted and spent 10 years in jail. In 1994, he was exonerated as a result of new information, specifically from DNA testing. Day has struggled with alcoholism, unemployment, and emotional trauma since leaving prison. In Simon's powerful portrait, he sits at a bar with a beer in front of him and returns the viewer's gaze. Although the dangling lights, framed pictures, and a poker machine crowd the scene, his honest stare is the focal point of the photograph. In another work from this same series, Simon portrays Hector Gonzalez, a witness to a br brutal gang-fueled attack at a nightclub. Entitled, uh, the name of the nightclub is Con Sabor uh, in New York. Gonzalez helped innocent bystanders at the scene of the crime and ended up with blood on his jeans. This blood led to his arrest and his conviction at age 18. Six years later, he was re released when DNA evidence and eyewitness testimony, testimony overturned his conviction. Upon release, when asked how he felt about the prosecutors who initially convicted him, he replied, I hated them, of course, but how am I supposed to feel now? After thinking about it for a few seconds, he said, right now, I'm just glad to be free. Inspired originally by an assignment from the New York Times Magazine, Simon turned the documentary work for the article into a haunting and dynamic series in which she places the subjects within spaces that reveal something to us about them, but almost simultaneously suggests an uncomfortable relationship with these spaces in which they are situated. I would be remiss in a lecture about modern and contemporary portraiture in which I reference the work of Taryn Simon to not talk about her most recent body of work, A Living Man Declared Dead and Other Chapters, that debuted at the Tate Modern last year and was recently on view at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. 
This most recent series of work includes photographs of individuals accompanied by text that explains some aspect of their story and their relationship to one another, and then accompanying imagery that relates to the story. These photographs are shot like passport photographs. They are deceptively simple, and the subjects are expressionless. The title of the series, A Living Man Declared Dead, comes from a family in India in which men were declared legally dead. As a result, they lost ownership to their land, and therefore, their landless families must struggle for survival. The two men depicted here are among those who have been declared dead. As a part of telling their story, the artist presents the, man, the men's bloodlines, their family trees, if you will. Blank boxes represent family members who were unwilling to participate or who were not able to be tracked down. Over a number of years, Simon worked meticulously on tracking the relationships between families for this photographic series. Part conceptual artist and part anthropologist, Simon weaves a tremendous story of survival. For Simon, photography and by extension portraiture walk a fine line between truth and fiction an idea explored in both the innocence and a living man declared dead. With this work, Simon asks, how might, an image of, how might an image be proof of life versus proof of death? The presentation of the artist's work is stark and scientific and the narratives intoxicating. In addition to a landless family in India, the artist represents a family affected by genocide in Bosnia, two families engaged in a dispute in Brazil, and non-traditional families, like children at an orphanage in Russia, or rabbits, uh, further stressing the scientific quality of her project. In an essay, Beyond Photography, about the series of work by Simon, theorist Homi Baba writes, a precarious sense of survival holds together the case studies encompassed by Taryn Simon's A Living Man Declared Dead in other chapters. Survival is the art of learning, how to conjure with contingency and circumstance. It is more dependent on practice and performance than on the articulation of principle. The agent of survival, whether individual or group, is fraught with an awareness of his or her own internal disjunctions, where rationality and effect cross paths and leave anxiety and ambivalence in their wake. Survival, in the words of Baba, reverberate in those lines earlier shared by Maya Angelou, who reminds us of the cyclical nature, both positive and negative, of active re resistance in her poem, Still I Rise. While Taryn Simon's work could be understood in the trajectory of environmental photography, formed and later refined by Newman, and then later blown open, blown wide open by Simon herself, her work is the product of the success of a number of women photographers in the 70s and 80s who began experimenting with portraiture and riffing off the idea of, straight, of the straightforward photograph and thinking about performance and, more broadly, concepts of gender. Cindy Sherman is one of these photographers who came of age when there was an increasing opportunity for women artists. I would not go as far to say that the door has been thrown wide open, but it is increasingly cracking open. Although Sherman has made a career out of representing herself in her works, they are not an inner exploration of personal identity. Instead, her works erase the artist's personal identity in their props and construction. Through the use of makeup, prosthetics, costumes, and sometimes special, specialized lighting and sets, Sherman creates works that often inspire the viewer to reconsider their own attitudes about gender and archetypes. Born in Glen Ridge, New Jersey, Cindy Sherman studied at Buffalo State College. After moving to New York City, she began a series of black and white photographs entitled The Untitled Film Stills. In these works, Sherman often represented scenarios and characters found in B-movies. The work depicted here is one of the most uh, recognizable of the artist's entire oeuvre. Sherman presents herself as the young ingenue, uh, a young woman with the big city on the horizon and her burgeoning career awaiting. 
In terms of the film stills, Sherman rarely pulls an image directly from a movie, um, but instead creates scenarios and is an active agent in the construction of identity of her photographs. The figure section of Behold America includes these two works uh, by Sherman, an early work created while the artist was still completing her studies, and a later work in which the artist exercises her full makeup and costume routine. In Untitled 2000, the artist portrays herself as a middle-aged young woman in a series of works that the artist referred to as California types. Uh, in, this work, in this work, Sherman assembles an identity for herself to perform that suggests stereotypical notions of a woman from California. Tan, makeup, bleached blonde hair, a tiara, the tracksuit. Um, is this about a focus uh, on fitness or the uniform of a mom on her way to pick up her kids uh, from school? Is she a former beauty queen, a middle-aged California Barbie? Sherman's photographs are, are most successful when they emphasize in-between spaces, when they lack solely mimetic functions, and when they are not easily identifiable as one type or the other. For example, the facial expression of, of the woman on the left uh, is at once mischievous and innocent. The woman on the right is more classifiable, but yet her decorative appearance and the juxtaposition of her outfit and her crown put in direct dialogue ideas about women, who they are and who society projects them to be. With Sherman, we have slowly started to move away from traditional portraiture, uh, and we're going to take a couple more right turns before we get back to the traditional idea of portraiture. The type of erasure of personal identity and, and exploration of gender um, that occurs in Sherman's photographs is echoed in the work of the Cuban-born performance artist Ana Mendieta. These photographs are a part of a series of nine works included in Behold America by Mendieta that suggests an ancient goddess symbol uh, repeated frequently in the artist's work. Although the position of hands raised often evokes thoughts of surrender uh, or, more or more sensitively, vulnerability. During her career, Mendieta employed the pose to suggest strength um, and the presence, the ancient presence, of the female form. Born in Cuba, Ana Mendieta came to the U.S. while she was still a young girl with her sister Raqueline as a result of the Pedro Pan project. They settled in Iowa, and Mendieta experienced a difficult cultural transition. She studied video art and performance art at the University of Iowa during a period of tremendous artistic innovation. During her time in graduate school, Mendieta was given the opportunity to study in Mexico. The country gave the budding artist great inspiration. Some of the performances staged in Mexico dealt quite literally with traditional culture referring to pre-Columbian, colonial, and folk art. The presence of Mendieta's figural forms in Behold America represent one of the ways in which the, this exhibition has sought to be inclusive of the many contributions of artists living in the United States with international roots inspired by foreign places, but who have also contributed to American visual culture. Laura, Laura Roulet wrote of this work, and yet another shadow in which she created in Mexico in 1976, we are brought to the water's edge and forced to confront the border, to see the trace of a body that is now no longer there. In this work, she inscribes her silhouette on the beach in Mexico, adds paint, red paint, to the water, uh, and photographs and films the successive stages in which the tide reclaims the figure and takes it out to sea. This shadow briefly inhabits the liminal space where the land and water meet, where Mexico's national frontier begins and ends. Other works by the artist demonstrate her persistent use of the goddess-like form. For example, the work on the left, also realized in Mexico, presents the outline of the goddess form with fireworks attached to it. As the firecrackers go off and then dissipate, the figure becomes less and less defined. In this work, the artist recalls the tradition of the burning of Judas figures and other ephemera at popular celebrations in Mexico. The work on the right is further evidence of her role as a pioneer in both body art and land art movements. 
Mendieta came of age at a time in the U.S. when artists were using their physical selves and the land itself as a medium. Although land art is usually thought of in terms of male artists and large structures, most commonly invoked by the artist Robert Smithson or the work Spiral Jetty, women too experimented with land art. It's worth noting that Mendieta's work was recently included in the Land Art Exhibition in Los Angeles at the Museum of Contemporary Art, but the work was small and left unexplained. An opportunity to explain her larger role within the context of land art uh, to those who visited the museum's galleries during the exhibition was lost. In Behold America, we see Anna Mendieta not in the context of land art, um, but in the context of her peers working in the U.S., uh, like Bruce Nauman and Joan Jonas. Before we veered back to traditional ideas of portraiture, I promised one more turn. While portraits are traditionally conceived as ways in which to communicate the appearance and personality of an individual, as we have seen, artists also create portraits of larger concepts tied to gender and the notion of identity, um, as opposed to personal identity, the notion, the idea of what identity is. The portraits that make up the figures section of Behold America aim to tell a collective story of American history. They are, in effect, together a portrait of the history of Americans. Different images combining together to create a portrait are found in the video piece Telephones by Christian Mar Marclay, a Swiss-American artist. Marclay, with the help of assistants, pieces together images from film and television to create a singular work of art, united by a singular idea. For example, his work Clocks united footage from disparate movies and television to show people keeping time or being concerned with time for a 20-hour period. As time passed, say 2, 3, 4 p.m., we see different characters looking at their watches, looking at their phones, remarking on the particular time. In Clocks and in Telephones, a work by the artist represented in the collection of the San Diego Museum of Art that will also be on view here during Behold America, Marclay combines irreverent popular culture with a deep probing examination of human nature and emotion. Telephones um, brings together the clips of phones ringing and being answered. They form a portrait of American film and, a por and, and an American society obsessed with film. Marclay chooses highly recognizable scenes with actors such as Katherine Hepburn, Jimmy Stewart, Humphrey Bogart, more recent films such as Mr. Mom, Jersey Girl, and Sleepless in Seattle are represented as well. For the artist, phone scenes are ubiquitous in films. They activate scenes, they create suspense, they link characters to one another. The still presented here is from Mr. Mom a scene in which Michael Keaton's character, Jack Butler, leans over to answer the phone while sitting on the couch. And it, if you bear with me for one moment, I'm going to show you telephones.
Hello? Hello? Yeah. What? Yes. Hello? Yes. Yeah. Hello. Hello? Hello? Hello, Felix? Hello? Hello, Dave? Hello? Hello? Hello. Hello? Hello? Hello, Janie? Listen, you... Listen, you... Who? We're all fine. How are you? Who? Jeff! Jeff! Darling, where are you? Darling, it's me. What? The girl's dead. Are you sure? Do you have a positive ID? Um, no, not exactly. I'm so confused. I told you not to call here. Yes, I know. I know. I haven't been able to think or concentrate on anything except you. I see. Well, what happened? What makes you think it was me? If I could just see you, just talk to you. You certainly can. I see. You don't listen, do you? No. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Now, 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 look. No, no, that's the worst thing you could possibly do. Oh, I see. Now, listen very carefully. But she doesn't know. Now, do you understand that she doesn't know what happened? No. see the show to see the rest and how it ends. The phone itself becomes the major protagonist of this piece, Telephones, by Christian Markley. The artist offers seductive images of phones, old phones, new phones, phones that match their environments. Here, Humphrey Bogart makes a phone call. Markley says that it's not about the actual films and their narrative contents, but about the creation of the piece and how the clips form their own narrative and comment on story structure of the phone scenes in movies. But in the context of other American work, it's hard not to think about how American films are exported and serve as a type of introduction or portrait of this society in distant places, or how Americans love the movies and how our collective ex experience and our collective experience of watching them. As a point of conclusion, I promised we would return to more traditional portraiture, and I, I thought we might take a look at the work of the artist Carrie Mae Weems, another artist whose work, when we, we think of portraits, we think of her, um, and she is represented in Behold America. In this work, the artist uses herself as a model in a series of works that were in part inspired by interactions with her students in which she realized that her male students often squared their shoulders to the camera, uh, whereas her women students often turned away from the camera uh, to create it a more profile uh, portrait. To play with this dynamic, the artist represents herself here in this photograph, um, squared to the camera, um, but she's not free um, and, and, and open. Um, there are these, these things that, that um, affect our view of her, namely the mirror before her on the table, the man that leans over her, the light above her functioning as, as a, t a reference to an interrogation room light. Weems is often associated with race, and many see her work as an exploration of racial stereotypes. For, from her perspective, the consistent theme of her work is power, and the black subject is steadily present as muse. Carrie Mae Weems recently recalled in an interview that she had a strong, clear-as-day memory of her father at age five, sitting her on his lap and telling her that she could be whatever she wanted to be in life and that she was as good as anyone else. Weems credits her strong and supportive family in addition to a childhood in Portland, Oregon, that led her to be less aware of racial injustice, uh, more prevalent in other parts of the United States. In fact, she says it was only after moving to California that she became aware of the magnitude of racism. racism. 
In California, she received a BFA from CalArts and an MFA here in San Diego at UCSD, where she studied with Eleanor Anton and David Anton. Both schools champion a theoretical, non-traditional mode of creating art, uh, which might seem as contra a contradiction to an artist interested in narrative art and in portraiture. But in the artist's use of image and text, these perspectives come together. In her highly acclaimed series, From Here I Saw What Happened and I Cried, Weems encourages viewers to look through the lens of a camera at images of black Americans. Found through years of research, pre predominantly at the Smithsonian in Washington or at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles. After finding portraits she wishes to use, she manipulates the image so that they are represented in the same format. The camera lens is literally evoked through the circular shape and the injection of red, which could invoke anger or a passionate emotion, uh, while in terms of a camera could conjure up the visuals of an infrared light, as though Weems asks us to look at the inner layer of the scene. Here the text reads, you became a scientific profile. It disrupts the narrative of this profile portrait. The black woman appears as a subject of study, and we are reminded of this country's history and how a photographic portrait can testify to past ideas and norms that were once accepted and are now no longer acceptable. Other works in the From Here I Saw What Happened and I Cried body of work by Weems include photographs with the text Anthropological Debate or portraits of laborers with the words house, yard, kitchen, reminding us of the identification with domestic workers in specific spaces, the limitation of these spaces, the repression of these spaces. From her perspective, the way white America sees itself through the black subject um, is, again, the focus of her work. She states, I want to give voice to a subject that has historically had no voice. While these images inspire great sadness in the artist herself, she explains that working with this material also inspires hope that our mutual humanity will be understood and embraced and that dignity that was perhaps missing from the original photographs that inspire her work will be established. Here we have the work by Weems that is included in Behold America as a part of the figure sections that will be on view here at the San Diego Museum of Art. It is a part of a series of works in which the artist is entitled Ain't Joking. Weems is interested in jokes and riddles and storytelling. These interests come from different sources, namely her father and her family's history that entails stories about growing up in the South, and also uh, her studies of folklore at Berkeley. Weems engages with deep levels of investigation, and as she explains, I am deeply interested in certain topics that keep presenting themselves to me over and over again. The bold graphic design here, the color red, and the relationship with text and image are jarring to the viewer, as is the question that recalls a history of injustice and the human toll of oppression and resistance. As you prowl the galleries filled with American art starting on November 10th, I hope you will think about how the history of American portraiture reflects a changing national identity. I hope um, we might also ask ourselves, what does it mean to be an American? to us. How are our identities tied to power, status, and gender? Um, issues exuded in Copley's portrait of Mrs. Thomas Gage and in the works of Cindy Sherman. How are the seemingly irreverent narrative functions of telephones by Christian Markley tied to histories presented in the work by Carrie Mae Weems? Nearly two years ago, I offered three words to describe this American nation, proud, conflicted, and defiant. I'm not sure myself if these are uniquely American qualities, yet but for me, they, these terms are a humble attempt to encapsulate a national mood that is so difficult to define. Proud. Whether it is the American with the don't mess with Texas sticker on their bumper or the American who deep in their thought quietly rides a train in the Italian countryside only to be interrupted when a loud, raucous group of people enter that same train car and suddenly find themselves hanging in temporary shame when realizing, oh, there are other Americans on this train. 
A sense of pride in one's country can be permanent or transitory, but it's mere, it's mere broad existence, um, it, even in fits and starts, suggests a shared feeling. Conflicted. The American in the 21st century, aware of economic struggle and past ingenuity and success, must struggle in her quest to define the future, but also must recognize that the past, as Carrie Mae Weems reminds us, is still not fully defined and recognized. Defiant. There is an oft-repeated phrase that Americans love a comeback story. While I'm not sure, sure that's a solely American position, it is a refrain that is so often evoked in terms of politicians, celebrities, uh, and athletes that it comes to mind so quickly when I think of being defiant. I can only describe American portraiture from the perspective of an art historian, and I can only describe being an American through my own subjective lens. Armed with knowledge about this show and this country's identity, I invite you to do both while you visit Behold America this fall and winter at the San Diego Museum of Art, the Timken Museum, and the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego. Lastly, if you will, if you'll allow me, I would like to return to the words of Maya Angelou from the poet herself. Everyone in the world has gone to bed one night or another with fear or pain or loss or disappointment. And yet each of us has awakened, arisen, uh, somehow made our ablution, seen other human beings, and said, morning, how are you? Fine, thanks, and you? It's amazing. Wherever that abides in the human being, there is the nobleness of the human spirit. Despite it all, black and white, Asian, Spanish, Native American, pretty, plain, thin, fat, Vow to celibate, we rise. You may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Just cause I walk as if I have oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like suns and like moons, with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still I rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my sassiness upset you? <laughs> Don't take it so hard just because I laugh. <laughs> As if I have gold mines digging in my own backyard. You can shoot me with your words. You can cut me with your lies. You can kill me with your hatefulness. But just like life, I rise. Does my sexiness offend you? Oh, does it come as a surprise that I dance? As if I have diamonds at the meeting of my thighs. Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past rooted in pain, I rise. A black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak miraculously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the hope and the dream of the slave. And so, naturally, there I go rising.